Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I'll start by introducing myself. So I'm John Adiojo, founder and chief data scientist at Data Centric Solutions. Uh, what's the purpose of this video today? I want to walk through a use case that I think is prominent across a lot of businesses. It's specifically around automation, and that is automating your manual document processing workloads. What do I mean by this? I think the best way for me to illustrate is to talk through an example from financial services. As you may or may not know, I used to work in banking. I used to lead data science teams and have over a decade's experience within banking. Some of my stakeholders were risk managers and those stakeholders would often come to me about ways to automate some of their day-to-day -day BAU activity. What type of activity are we talking about here? Well, one in particular that I can recall was a risk manager that had to look at fund prospectuses, which were long documents, could be up to 200 pages long, containing information about investment funds that the bank had a relationship with or was going to enter into a relationship with. This information is publicly available and gives details on the investment strategy of the fund and things of that nature to help investors make better decisions. So what this risk manager had to do was look at this fund uh, prospectus and pull out key information which would be recorded in an Excel spreadsheet, so in a structured data form. And the purpose of that recording was to have it on record, for one, obviously, but also for downstream analytics. So any analytics that we were going to perform on across our fund portfolio would be done on the basis of that Excel spreadsheet. Now, as you may imagine, this is a very time consuming process. It was pretty tedious. And we're just talking about one fund here or a group of funds here, but imagine extending that out to thousands of funds and how much time investment that would take from risk managers across the years and how much time investment from the bank across the years to do that. Obviously, risk managers would rather be spending their time on more strategic initiatives rather than doing this type of manual repetitive document processing. What I want to demonstrate to you today is an approach for automating that. Now, it is a prototype. It's not perfect, but it's definitely sets you on your way to be able to build an engine to automate this type of document processing and with a bit more sophisticated prompt engineering and maybe the use of some more sophisticated concepts like agents and react prompting, it could be a production grade tool. Having said that, I think it's best to jump into the demonstration, which I'll first show you by streaming at the front end, and then I'll get into the back end of the code and we can unpick it and see the details of how it works behind the scenes. The first thing I'm going to do is pull up the fund documentation to give you a understanding of what we're looking at. So this is the fund prospectus. And I will sift right up to the top here to, to show you what we're looking at. This is available publicly for you via Google. If you just type in prospectus of Morgan Stanley Funds UK, you should be able to pull this link directly from Google. However, I will supply it in the description to this video for anyone interested in reviewing this document themselves. So what's in here, as you can see, it's around 164 pages. It's really long. Uh, you couldn't, unfortunately, you can't just put this into chat GPT or even just call the chat GPT or GPT-4 or 3.5 API on this use. The context window would soon be maxed out if you took that approach. So we've got to take some other approaches. Um, what's in here specifically? So we've got a group of, we've got different types of funds. So we've got um, equity funds here, bond funds, multi-asset, base currency, and then we've got um, the individual fund products within there. 
And if we scroll down to the first one, let's just pull one out. Right, so under the equity funds, we have the De developing opportunity fund. So what information would a risk manager want to pull out of this? Maybe something like the product reference number. I think that would probably be important for identifying the fund. We've got the investment objective, which is outlined here three to five years. We've got the investment policy, which is outlined. And there's quite a bit of information on that. The investment strategy, I gather that would be important as well. And another thing that is, I know from experience is important when it comes to reporting on these types of funds is the ESG metrics. So understanding whether or not a fund is moving in the direction of being kind of, I don't know what the word is to use here, but ESG compliant, let's say, that's, um, that's often important for a risk managed, manager to understand. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to demo the tool now and show you how we can use this tool to actually pick out some of those key bits of information and store them in a data frame. It's pretty simple, uh, straightforward. Again, this is a prototype, so it's not perfect. And I wouldn't say this is production ready by any means, but it's just a proof of concept to show that it can be done using the methodology I have shown. All right, so let's look at the global, let's look at the developing opportunity fund and pull that out. I will open up the streamlit front end and I think that's already prepped with the API key. Great. And we will put that developing opportunity fund there and hit submit. So that's being sent to the pipeline and the information that we want is being extracted just know if you are going to follow along with this you will need an open ai api key and there are some instructions to get that in the technical blog which will be released with this video as soon as it's published i think in the front end itself if you do go via that route i have linked to some documentation to show you how to get the open ai api key Great, so it has returned a structured result. Let's just expand that and we'll go through line by line just to, or column by column rather, just to see if it's returned what we want it to return. So the product reference number first is 920646. And if we jump back into the documentation and let's just have a look if that is indeed the product reference number, that's correct. So 920646. Let's see. So the equity fund itself is the developing opportunity fund. Fantastic. And we have, have we pulled that through? Yes, we have developing opportunity fund. The investment objective fund aims to grow your investment over three to five years. And let's just make sure that is correct. So the fund aims to grow your investment over three to five years. Fantastic. That's been pulled through correctly. The next thing here is actually the investment strategy. So let's just expand that. The investment process will emphasize a bottom up stock selection process, seeking attractive investments on individual company basis. That is seems quite generic, but let's just have a look. So the investment strategy, so bottom up stock selection process, seeking attractive investments on an individual company basis. So it has pulled that out, although it is fairly generic. It's probably some more details we would have wanted to capture there, but it's okay for, for a proof of concept or prototype. Um, the investment policy, let's just expand that out. So the funds objective will be pursued by investing in primarily portfolio of equities, uh, the portfolio, may be at times concentrated and will generally hold less than 50 holdings. So that's what it's pulled out as the investment policy. Let's just have a look to see if that's correct. And again, it's, it's fairly specific there. Just having a quick scan through here. On a consolidated, that's 50%. 
markets. So from what I can see, just having a quick scan through, that doesn't quite seem accurate. And again, you know, just is one of these things where, where large language models sometimes have a propensity to hallucinate. But most of the criteria that's captured seems to be right, especially the more well-defined ones. Oh, uh, let's try another example and let's just see how that works with a another example. So let's go down to, we won't do the next one, we'll do the next one after that and let's have a look. Right, okay, so what if we did the Global Brands Equity Income Fund? Let's have a look to see if we were, if we can capture the data here and let's say return all of the, right, let's just do it in the same way. So let's not cheat. Let's do it in exactly the same way. Global Brands Equity Fund. So that's the fund we want to analyze. We're running the extract data pipeline. And this should just take a few moments. Great, so it has actually pulled it through and it's added, it's appended that to our structured data set, which is great, that's what we want. So let's have a look. So the product reference number here is 757428. Have we correctly identified that? We have, so it does quite well at identifying product reference numbers. Investment objective is over five to 10 years and it's growth over five to 10 years. Um, let's just have a look. So it's provide quarterly income and to grow your investment over five to 10 years. Let's just confirm that that is the case. And that is exactly the case. So it does really well at identifying that as well. Let's expand out. Let's see the other parts. So the investment objective we've checked. What about the investment strategy? So the fund is, and this is a little more verbose. So Hopefully this is correct and it's not a hallucination. The fund is concentrate is a concentrated portfolio, typically 25 to 50 holdings and seeks to identify high quality companies with sustainably high returns on operating capital. Dominant franchises, powerful intangible assets, including brands, networks, licenses, pricing power. The fund also seeks to identify capable management teams able to allocate capital effectively to grow franchise and sustain or improve the return on operating capital so that is a lot let's just check to see if that is the case so i'm just gonna grab this if i can can i copy this up let's just see yeah i can so let's just grab that and paste that to the side for reference and i'll bring that down here Right, so we have that for reference. Great, so let's just keep that to one side for a moment. And let us pull in the fund documentation, which is here. Great, so expanding that, let's just have a look. It was the Global Brands Fund. So it wasn't that one. It wasn't the, the Global Brands Fund. It was the one after that, I believe. Global Sustain wasn't that one. I think it was. Oh, interesting seem to have lost track of which one it was let's just go back here and we'll do global brands equity fund oh ah, yeah i guess it was that one we go back right okay global brands equity fund great so this is the supposed investment strategy and let's just see what it's pulled out 
So here it said fund is a concentrated portfolio, typically 20 to 50 holdings. That actually says 20 to 40. So that's not quite correct with the numbers there. There's a hallucination in there, but it's important to note this. That's fine. And seeks to identify high quality companies with sustainably high returns on operating capital with dominant franchises. So that is that seems to be correct. It, so what it's done is it's actually managed to pull out a lot of the investment strategy at the top here. It's just that it has hallucinated a slight bit there. So it's saying 25 to 50 holdings when it should actually be 20 to 40 holdings. That's really that's an interesting point to take note of. Uh, that's not completely correct. And we will have to if we want to put this into production. We'll have to find a way to manage those hallucinations. And there are there are frameworks for that, fortunately. Um, as an essential fund also seeks to identify capable management team. So is there? Yep. Yeah, so that is that's all in there, correct? So other than the hallucination here, it seems to have successfully identified that part of the investment strategy anyway, which is good. Not perfect and not suitable for production, but good enough, meaning that it is looking in the right place, which is great. Next, let's have a look at what is returned for the investment policy. So if we grab that investment policy and put that down here, and we can then open up the fund prospectus again so and this is this is pretty verbose this is there's a lot of information respond returned here but you know it's to be expected because the investment policy itself is pretty long so it says the fund invests at least 80 percent of its assets in shares of companies in developed countries on a global basis so is that true it shares in developer companies only. so that is true that's directly from here so that's correct it also provides a, a regular income stream through dividends from high quality steady yielding distributing equity securities and premiums from selling index call options so is there anything about steady dividend equity securities premium from selling index call options aiming to deliver a yield so that actually seems fairly correct. That's that's well phrased, actually. And there are some additional numbers in here. So again, I think we're suffering from some hallucinations because after that, there is this thing about the index consists of over 1,500 large and medium-sized constituent companies from over 23 countries respect representing a broad cross section of the global developed market so where is this coming from um do that's not mentioned directly under the investment policy you can't see that anywhere but is it mentioned anywhere further down ah here we go so what's happened is it's actually gone into the performance measurement section and pulled this bit out and returned that under our investment policy I guess it kind of makes sense along the investment policy, but that's where we want to be careful with the prompt engineering here and make sure that we are pulling out and isolating the right bits that we want to summarize or we're choosing appropriate variables to summarize from the document in the first place. Okay, great. I think the last component we want to look at is the ESG component. So we have said for this one that it's false. Let's just have a look to see if that's captured or if there's anything mentioned about ESG. Okay, so there's something mentioned about ESG under the investment strategy. So the as an essential integrated part of the investment process, blah, 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 capital, social and governance factors, financial company, management teams. The investment manager retains discretion over which investments are selected. In exercising this discretion, ESG factors are not the sole determinant of whether an investment can be made on made or a holding can remain in the fund's portfolio. 
but instead the investment manager considers material risk or opportunities in any of the ESG areas which could threaten or enhance the high returns on operating cap capital of a company. So I guess it's a bit ambiguous, but I think the model or the the, the retrieval and extraction has stated that it thinks it's false, that it's not technically an ESG fund, which I guess makes sense. So all in all, I think it does okay for a prototype. There's some work here to do, obviously, in fine tuning those prompts and engineering those prompts to first reduce hallucinations and also to ensure that we're capturing the information that we want to return rather than bits and pieces from areas that don't necessarily make any sense to return. Uh, okay, fantastic. So let's get into the actual back end of this. And before I present the back end, I want to show just a high level architectural diagram of how this thing works. I have one prepared earlier and I'll just make sure I'm getting the right version up for you. Correct. So this is the right version. Great. Hopefully this is large enough on the screen, but I will zoom in a little bit. Okay. Let's take that out. Okay. So what you've seen here is essentially the same as the demonstration that's what's involved but it's a bit of a breakdown it's more of a breakdown of how this thing is working behind the scenes we have a query sent through about a fund that we want to have a look at that is sent and transformed using a sentence embedding pre-trained model and that's all coming from hugging faces sentence embedding models and these are, for those of you that haven't used Hugging Face, it's an excellent open source library or open source platform that you can use several libraries on and it provides you with access to pre-trained transformer models or sentence embedding models that you can implement into your own workflows. So I've used that here to generate sentence embeddings. Just to briefly touch on sentence embeddings for those that aren't familiar, Sentence embeddings are a way to represent your sentences or your text as a dense vector representation. So essentially we get a numeric representation of the text. And the reason we want a numeric representation of the text is because we can then perform manipulations on that. And that's we can models can work with that numeric representation. It's important to remember that sentence embeddings do preserve the semantic structure of the sentence. So when we talk about semantics, we're talking about the, the underlying meaning rather than just the, I think it's the lexical, which is just the the words themselves. Uh, if you, it's, I would say it's worthwhile having a look and trying to understand if you're gonna work in anything to do with natural language processing, or if you're going to work with large language models, get to understand the difference between semantic and lexical. Okay. So <clears throat> let's move on and let's have a look. So we have our stack of documents here, which is our fund prospectus. That is pre-processed. The pre-processing involves breaking that down into smaller chunks and the reason we do that is so that it's actually manageable downstream and we want that to be the case because the haystack library that we're working with needs our documents to be in a certain format to be able to perform so we do all of that document reformatting in the pre-processing step the next step is doing our sentence embedding so creating our sentence embeddings and creating a vector store so there's two aspects of this. We have a SQL Lite database, which actually stores our documents. And I'll take a step back. We have a large fund prospectus, which is broken down into smaller documents. What do I mean by smaller documents? We break it down on the sentence level, on the paragraph level, into what we call documents. So for one fund prospectus, there could be thousands of these individual documents. That's done in the pre-processing 
step, then that's moved on to the step where we generate our sentence embeddings. So for each of those small documents, we generate sentence embeddings and that is indexed by face, which is a open, it's open source. I think it's open source, but it's a, a library from Meta that allows us to perform similarity search over vectors. So over our sentence embeddings. So we have those indexed, but we also have simultaneously stored in a SQLite database. We have the documents themselves stored so we can easily retrieve those via the indexing and we can perform similarity search using face over those sentence embeddings at a later step. And you can see that now. So the pipeline itself consists of two elements. We have the node one here, which is a retriever node. In the retriever node, we perform similarity search based on the query. So remember this query is actually embedded. We create the sentence embedding for that query. And then we perform the similarity search over the documents that have been indexed uh, via face as well. And that will return a subset of those documents that is most relevant to the query from the user. So once we have that subset of documents, we pass that into OpenAI and we return a function call on that. And within that function call is where we define the information that we want to extract out of that subset of documents. Finally, we return the structured data set and that's kind of the output that you saw in the prototype that I demoed earlier. So great. I hope that is clear. And again, if you need more clarity on this, or you want to see this in a bit more, you want, you'd rather read this and try to take it in. I have written a technical blog detailing all of this, and it will be available in the description under this video as soon as it is published. Fantastic. So let's get into the code itself and we'll get into the details of how this ecosystem or how this thing works. So pulling up the code, I think it's worthwhile showing you the Jupyter Notebook version just because <clears throat> the notebook version just steps through each thing step by step and you can you can get a better understanding of what we're doing. So at the top here, all of this is is just reading the OpenAI API key from a .yaml file that I have saved locally. Uh, for those that are kind of new to using <clears throat> APIs and API keys, don't make the mistake of writing your API keys directly into your script. Always have them saved in a configuration file somewhere else on your computer for security reasons so that you can read that in rather than have it written. Uh, you don't want to make the mistake of revealing your API key publicly and especially if you're pushing your projects to GitHub, you don't want to have your open AI key publicly available to people on GitHub to use. I think in the case of OpenAI, they have technology that scans and detects whether the keys have been revealed publicly and they will just end up um, invalidate, invalidating that key if that's the case anyway. So the next step here is the pre-processing of the documents. And this is the step that I was describing earlier. And it's pretty easy to do because um, Haystack provides you with an API for pre-processing the documents. And that's this convert files to docs. Um, well, there's two parts of it. There's the convert files to docs and then there's the pre-processor object here. So the convert files to docs function just takes a document part as an argument. And that's where you keep your fun prospectus or whatever document you'd like to automatically process, right? Um, or you'd like to pre-process and that reads it in. And the good thing about this is it can detect whether it's a PDF or docx or doc, um, txt file. So you don't have to specifically define functions to pull the different types of files and it can automatically pick that up. 
The next thing is this preprocessor object. And here is where we define the way that the document is split up. So here in particular, we talk about a split length and a split overlap. And this is important to pay attention to because this defines exactly how your documents are split. So the split length is the obviously the length of sentence before a split is generated. So how, how long are those chunks we're splitting up? And then the split overlap is, is there any overlap between one split? So one sentence versus the, the other. So in this case, there's a 30 word overlap between the two splits. And you know, this is something that is advised for question answering. I'll be honest, I don't know if it's the best approach to do this type of document um, keyword extraction that we're doing here, but I have left it in here from a legacy piece of code. So that is, that's, good practice for question answering but not necessarily for the approach we're doing and as with much of machine learning on building these type of ai apps you have to experiment and decide what works best for the application you're trying to produce great the next thing is defining the phase vector store so i think i mentioned before there's there's two parts to this right so there's the indexing bit which is where you know, we we have these sentence embeddings and they're indexed with face. And that's just so we can perform efficient um, similarity searches over over the those embeddings. But then there's also the SQLite um, on-disk database. And that's where we store the actual documents themselves that we've defined the splits for earlier. Uh, this is important and we're just defining that and defining where we store those locally so the actual storage process is done here and again this is an an object provided by that we can initialize and it's prov it's provided to you by um, haystack it makes it pretty easy all you need to do is define where you want to create your database store um, you want to define the face index um, indexing parameter and that's flat. Uh, I just, I can't recall off the top of my head what the flat parameter indicates to, but I will leave a note in the description to, to let you know what that is. And then you want to find the embedding dimensions. And this is important because this has to match the sentence embedding model that you are using. Mm. So your face, your embedding dimensions, I repeat, has to match the sentence embedding model you're using. Otherwise, you're going to get some errors. Once that's done, you can write that to your document store. So that's just going to write to your database DB. Great. So we're going to jump a little bit ahead here because I want to show you where we actually apply the sentence embeddings. So as you might remember, we defined our document store earlier, right? So Haystack provides a, an object, which is the embedding retriever here. And that allows you to, first of all, generate your, you can, you can, um, you can define within uh, apologies. So face define with, once you have your document store, defined here you can proceed to update your embeddings and you'll do that with the embedding retriever as well so what it's, what that does essentially is it just prepares us it prepares the document store with all of those embeddings generated from the embedding model which is coming from the hugging face transformers library and then we can perform the similarity search over those embeddings and that's why it's done here um, the reason for the little bit of confusion earlier is because the retrieval step is actually later down in the pipeline, but we do need to perform this bit. So we have the embeddings to actually retrieve later on. So all we're doing here is generating those embeddings and having those indexed with face. And that's how we do it. We do it by 
leveraging the update embeddings. And remember that document store is an object, right? And we defined that object earlier up here, and that's a face document store. So that operation we're performing is an object that we can perform on, uh, is, is a method we can perform on the face document store object that we've defined here. And now uh, hopefully you can see why it's important to have those embedding dimensions of 768 because if we jump back down here um, we have our Im embedding model defined here and if I put that into hugging face you will see which type of sentence embedding model that is so we've got all mpnet base v2 and you can see there that's 768 dimensions so your embedding model has to match the dimensions you set for your face document store. And um, that's how you prevent any errors coming through. Great. So once we have that, um, we want to define our pipeline. So again, forgive me because I'm going to have to jump between elements of the code here, but I'm sure this will all be available for you uh, on GitHub to review yourself in your own time. Um, so let's just have a look at how we define that pipeline. So we get a pipeline object from Haystack. Again, a Haystack is pretty convenient. And defining a pipeline is simply about adding nodes. Now, the retriever node is where we perform that similarity search. So as I described earlier in that architectural diagram, we have the embedding from the query and we have the embeddings in that have been indexed with face and then we use face to perform the similarity search across those embeddings. The output of the retriever is are those documents that are relevant to the query, right? So that's what is done here. And the retriever is an object that is already available to us from Haystack. So we don't need to create any kind of custom component for this. That's already available. And I'll show you where we define that to give you a bit more comfort. So that embedding retriever is that's already available from Haystack. That is something that you simply just define here and call later on in the pipeline. So that's the first step of our pipeline. So we've added that node. The next step is a little more tricky. Uh, Haystack doesn't actually provide, well, at the time of recording this video, Haystack doesn't provide an OpenAI function call for you. So you have to create a custom component to do this. And it's pretty straightforward. Hey, Haystack makes it really easy to create custom components. I'll show you how I have done it. So you inherit from the base component and you know, outgoing edges is one. And I believe this is because it's just, if you just have one outgoing edges, it's not like a decision node. So it's not where you can take either or um, it's one path or the other. It's just input and then one output. And it's, it's deterministic output. It's just the, the one output that you, you define. So your outgoing edges is set to one, unless it's a decision node that you're trying to set here. The next thing is just really just defining what the function, what your component, what you want it to do. And in our case here, we want the component to perform um, function calling. Now, if you're not familiar with function calling, what it enables you to do is take a structured, take an unstructured data set or a piece of text as an input and then identify bits of that piece of text that you'd like to store as arguments that you can feed to a function later down the line. I do have a technical tutorial on function calling and I'll link that tutorial at the, in the description for this video, but I'm not gonna go into too much detail here specifically about function calling um, because I've already covered it in the tutorial. So please, have a watch of that if you want to know more about function calling. Great. So let's just have a look quickly about how we're doing this function calling. So it's set with a list of dictionaries and 
as you can see, we've defined what the function is doing. So it's the update data frame function that we want, and we want to update it with, we want to write the fund details to the data frame. Um, and then we get into the nitty gritty here. So it's defining the actual details that we want. And this is the thing that's important to note about function calling is you've got to get these descriptions right, because that's what the large language model is going to use to grab the details you want from your document. So you might recognize here, we've got the product reference number and the description is the FCA product reference number, which will be six or seven digits. That seemed to work well as a description is our two examples. It managed to pull the product reference number. Okay. Here we've got the investment objective and, you know, type string and you, you say you should return the investment objective of the fund. This is likely to be something like this. The fund aims to grow your investment over T to T plus Delta T years. Okay. Now, obviously that works if we're looking at a fund prospectus like the JP, um, sorry, like the Morgan Stanley one that I demoed, uh, where every fund objective is investment objective is like that. But if you're to generalize this across different fund prospectuses or different types of documents that won't work. So you'll need to obviously be careful about how you're prompting here. The investment policy, return a summary of the funds investment policy, no more, no more than two sentences. Now, look, this is a legacy one because in the, in the other one, I've in the one behind the front end, I've stated that it should return a little bit more detail than this, just because the, as you saw, the investment policies can be quite long. Again, this is just testament to you having to be careful how you, how you design this prompt. So prompt engineering does come into this as a factor to make sure that you're returning the right information. It's the same with the investment strategy here. And then we've got a little thing for ESG just to return true and false, true or false. If the fund is an ESG fund, that might be a bit vague again. So if you're building production apps, you will need to really consider how you write these um, function calls to make sure you're capturing the right information. And then lastly, return the name of the fund. And then under the required, we've got all of these that we want, we want to return in the function call. Great. So then we define our open AI um, endpoint or we define the, the API key. So we want the chat completion. Um, the model here is GPT 3.5 turbo. Now for the front end, I did use GPT 4 and it's advised to use GPT 4 when you're trying to do more complex tasks. In this case, I gather it is more complex due to the, we're asking the model to also interpret what's written. Um, and these are just standard protocols for function calling. So instead of calling the chat completion model, we're calling, uh, we've set it so that it's a function call here and we set it to auto. So it decides the model can actually decide whether or not it's suitable to use a function call or not. This is all again, thing, these are things I've explained in my function call tutorial. So please have a watch of that if you would like to know a little bit more about function calling. <clears throat> we've already gone through the embeddings bit. So as you can see, once we've defined our custom component, um, which is the OpenAI function call object that we've defined, and I'll just go back up there just to show you that and give you a bit more comfort. There, there we go, that's defined. <clears throat> once we've defined our custom component, it's really easy with Haystack just to add that to a pipeline. So that works and it will take the input from the output from the retriever as an input, which will be those documents that are relevant to our query. And then we then respond with um, a structured JSON. I think it's, a, it's either a dictionary or JSON we respond with that has our our um, 
arguments that we define in our function call. And then it's a matter of writing those to variables. So that's the response we get. <clears throat> res here, we want to write those to our variables. And then those variables can be written to a data frame. And it's as simple as that. That is it in terms of the back end. And again, this is all available for you in the GitHub repository for you to review yourself and play with. Okay. So let's just talk a, a bit about the limitations of this type of approach. So I think you already saw <clears throat> that hallucinations can be a big problem here. And I guess thinking we probably want to think about how to solve those types of hallucinations if we're going to try to move this into production. So one way is, if you notice, there isn't any kind of, there isn't any major prompt engineering I've done in there. It's simply just doing the retriever step. And then after the retriever step, we do some, um, we do some, uh, we do a function call after that. And that's the next step in the pipeline and then return, return our structured response. So as far as I can see, the hallucinations could be coming from a few areas. Potentially, it could be on the retriever step. So the embedding model we use, although it's I think 768 dimensions, it's not this. It could be the way we've set set up that embedding model. And if we use something a bit more heavy duty, we, we might be able to reduce the level of hallucinations on the other side of it. I doubt it's that. I think it's probably more likely to be the way we're calling the large language model on those on that summarized set of documents. Um, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because there is an interaction there, right? So you've got your retriever, which pulls out your summarized set of documents and um, oh, your, re your relevant set of documents. And ultimately that's a subset. You want that subset to be as close to the reality of what you want to look at as possible. And if your initial sentence embedding model is not high dimensional enough, um, you're gonna lose some of that information. So that might cause some model hallucinations. It might cause a few inaccuracies, but it seems like it might not be there because it seems like for some things, it's picked out exactly what we need. It's just where we've asked it to summarize that the problem comes in so where we've got larger paragraphs of text where we've asked it to summarize the, the large language model was hallucinating so react prompting could be a good way to do this so attaching an agent to that pipeline and using react prompting and getting that agent to kind of think through what it's doing has been shown to reduce hallucinations a bit with large language models so that might be the case we might also act to break down those variables that we return to much smaller and simpler variables instead of asking it to summarize a whole paragraph of text and that should reduce the capacity for hallucinations as well as you can see it seems to work really well when we're asking it to summarize well-defined areas like what's the what's the what's the investment strategy and we've defined it as the investment strategy is going to look something like this from x um from from t to t plus delta time that seems to work really well. It seems to work really well when it we ask it to return the product reference number as well. So yeah, maybe defining, being very specific about what you want to define and making it as short as possible instead of asking it to summarize long bits of text is going to work more in your favor to reduce hallucinations too. That's kind of on the limitations of it. Obviously, if you're taking this production as well, you're not going to have just one document, you're going to have probably thousands of prospectuses or thousands of whatever type of document that you want to process. So you want to consider the effective storage approach for that and how you're going to keep track of everything. And that's where you're talking about kind of central, like decentralized cloud based approaches where, um, you, instead of storing locally with a SQLite database, you store on cloud and 
unfortunately, I think Face works very well with cloud storage as well. And it's designed to operate over, over huge numbers of embeddings. Uh, that works well and that's scalable. Also, I know that Haystack is, is quite a good library for building the building more scalable applications. So you can take a prototype like this and still use Haystack to build your production grade, like scalable um, application. Great. Um, I think that's pretty much it on this topic. I hope you did enjoy it. If you did like the video, please comment, please like, please subscribe and share as well. We are a small channel trying to build up. Your engagement really helps us and your subscription really helps us. I will be putting out more videos on topics like this. So if you enjoy, uh, stay tuned because there is more to come out. The technical blog will be available as soon as it is published and I'll link to this description. I'll link to the, the um, I'll link to that blog in the description for the video. That's pretty much it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and any any uh, ways that you feel like you could improve this or any any constructive criticism would be fantastic. And yeah, please recommend this channel to anyone that wants to get into building AI applications. And you know, it could be a data scientist, software engineer, developer, uh, analyst, you name it. Uh, well, we're all on this journey together and um, a lot of progress is being made in the field and it's good to share knowledge and good to, to share experiences. So yeah, thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next video.